Okay, thanks again. And welcome back to our Q&A session. And hello, Addison. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining us. So um, we had this absolutely awesome um, track on vulnerability research, and we have more or less everyone here with us. Yuan uh, had to leave uh, for another meeting. I guess we are all accustomed to this now. Um, so for 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 my first question. Um, I was very much interested to uh, taking up a few of the questions that came up through the Slido. Um, so thinking of our first uh, speaker, so Pedro, this one is for you. Um, before I get to troll about IPv6. Uh, <laughs> so someone asked, how does OpenWRT or slash PFSense stack up to the closed source models uh, that are being used? Okay, that's a pretty good question. Um, personally, I, when I buy a router, I always look for one that supports OpenWRT or DDWRT. PFSense I haven't used. Uh, they're kind of all the same. Um, but to be honest, I never really audited OpenWRT or DDWRT myself. Uh, but I have uh, audited uh, routers that use OpenWRT as a base. So some manufacturers, they take OpenWRT and then they extend it. And the base is pretty secure. Usually when we find a router with OpenWRT, that's base is pretty secure. So we look for the vendor specific information. Um, so yeah, I'd recommend, I'd say that the OpenWRT, DDWRT code is much better than almost every consumer router vendor code. But again, with the caveat that I haven't really audited uh, myself, but I use it, so. Yeah, yeah thanks, sorry, I was muted. Um, thanks for this one. Um, I have, um, like, as I said, um, but this may be something also, if it's a can jump uh, on. Um, to my knowledge, there is, there is little expertise on I don't know, say IPv IPv6 uh, packet filtering. So considering your expertise on either protocol or equipment, um, can you tell us a bit about, you know, some kind of forecasting uh, of sorts? Um, can you elaborate on specific vulnerabilities that we can uh, expect in the coming years um, on, protocols um, and the equipments that we'll need to handle them um, that we are not so much versed into, that we don't have so much expertise into? So there are common, there are a few already around. So one of them is recently, uh, you know, the fact that IPv6 interprets uh, some strings uh, you know, some uh, strings that look like URLs interprets them as addresses. So if I'm not mistaken, this was used recently in an exploit. I can't remember exactly, but I'm sure it's easy to find on Google. Uh, that, so that's one, one example. Another example is, for example, IPv6 auto configuration. So this, while it tries to reduce complexity, it also introduces an unexpected attack vector, right? So if a vendor, uh, thinks of, you know, vendors typically have a lot more experience with IPv4 as we do, right? So they typically see IPv6 as an add-on and they tend to forget the existence of Slack auto configuration and these kind of things. So this might open up new avenues for exploitation. Uh, and then also we have these firewall bypasses. It can be as simple as you have a service listening on all ports. It also binds to IPv6 and you forget to firewall on IPv6, so can be a simple, a simple mistake, you know? And I think finally, the, the last part would be the attacking the implementation itself. Whereas I guess most devices will use Linux. So, you know, it's kind of more secure, so to speak, more eyes are on it. Some vendors, they have their own uh, IP protocol implementations, so their own internet protocol implementations in there. I'm sure there'll be a lot of bugs these custom ones. 
Yeah, my um, guess is bug, the number of bugs is not going to decrease anytime soon. Um, still, since we are still on a protocol um, topic, Ivica, can you like? Would you like to jump on that question right now? Yeah, with pleasure. Um, let me share um, one little and innocent story that I had recently. I was playing around with Windows 2019 and 2016. So I realized they have IPv6 stack enabled by default and Microsoft recommends not to disable it. But I was actually investigating something around um, rerouting stuff, injecting routes. Um, and what I discovered is um, you can pretty quickly develop um, mechanics or the code that will uh, inject router advertisements or routing info into the IPv6 stack of, of any Windows server. So first, you know, I was like surprised, like why or how can you do that? But then when I thought a little bit more about it, I concluded it's actually a legitimate functionality. You know, this is something that, um, that exists even in the IP4 stack uh, world where you have um, these ICMP redirects and things that most of the environments today will forbid. However, very similar thing ex existed in the IPv6. So I wasn't actually quite sure how to interpret that result. So I contacted Microsoft, I explained them, you know, how the whole thing went. And actually it was aligned with my expectations because they said, that's not a um, bug, that's, that's not a security flaw, that's um, legitimate functionality. And I fully agree with that. The only thing that I thought of, why would you leave that by default? Why would Windows servers need to have IPv6, anything enabled by default, you know, any kind of routing engine? So that, that, that's the, the thing that, that remained kind of open. And yes, to, um, to answer your question, IPv6 is coming um, big way. I think the, the probably biggest security issue for now is that we don't know. We don't know much about that protocol because it's not so widespread. We surely know how to use IPs and assign them, but what are the security intricacies of it? I don't know. It's it remains to be seen in the coming years, I guess, and decades, I believe. Yeah, we, we need some more foresight, um, you know, on, on emerging, not just technologies, but also threats for existing technologies. Um, I'll get back to, to, to you in a minute. Um, I wanted just to give the, the opportunity to um, Florian and Stephanie to tell us whether they are aware um, of any recent cases of Canadian security researchers being prosecuted under the criminal code due to their research. Um, like in other words, you know, have stuff gone wrong for someone who in good intentions um, has tried to disclose, uh, you know, a vulnerability? I'll hand that off to Florian, who is the legal expert here. Yes, and I would have one of this to, to you and Rosalia to leave because she's exactly doing a LLM thesis on this, on this topic. And it's kind of a gray area. We know of some cases and there is like case law, like decisions, you no know, using those provisions, but very few, at least publicly available. And often you know, in, in those cases, people have like gag order, et cetera. So it's very complex to know exactly or it was used. So we heard of many cases. That's why we started that research project to try to better define the framework and maybe call for law reforms, you know, to better protect um, defensive uh, hacking intrusions and uh, vulnerability disclosures, uh, et cetera. And that's also like within that framework that Stephanie and you are now working on the, the, re the report. Yep, thanks. Um, and, and another question that came up um, is um, whether you have heard of the communication security establishments uh, equities management framework. And if yes, what do you think about it? Because I think your 
uh, your discussion was on on another entity's um, equities approach to 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 reuse the U.S. term. <laughs> Over uh, to you. Well, yes. So during our presentation, we did mention the CAC's equities um, framework, their process, and we have heard of the framework. It has been available since March 2019, but it is really, really short and opaque. Um, I have several critiques of it, and one is that only parties of the CSC are involved in the process. So unlike the U.S.'s uh, Vulnerabilities Equities Program, which they call the VEP, um, their program has a range of people from different departments who represent the agency views. While as in the CSE's framework, it's just CSE members who are deciding whether or not to disclose or hide vulnerabilities. Also, the framework is really short. The U.S.'s unclassified VEP is super thorough. Uh, the CSEs doesn't offer information like what's in scope of their uh, framework, the exceptions, thorough detailing of the responsibilities of the actors involved, things like that. And the last critique I have is a small critique because it is also, you could argue that what the U.S. has is symbolic in the sense that their VEP has one transparency mechanism, which is annual reporting, um, which at the very least provides some information on the yearly um, activities done under the VEP procedure. And the CSC doesn't have anything like that. It is a very short document, not comprehensive, and it's still just leaving us with more questions than answers. Yeah, that's, um, don't get me started. <laughs> <laughs> and if I may add also, you know, Go ahead. maybe the, the new framework, like, well, framework with, with quotes, the that short document doesn't provide also some, you know, uh, guarantee, some safeguards for safety researchers, you know, to be sure that if they go forward and reach out to the government to help out, it's going to help out like society and not the government <laughs> against society. And there's some conversation right now in the national security and interest community as part of the reviews of the agency's uh, practices with NCIRA, uh, which is like the, the watchdog of the national security agencies uh, in Canada, to, to look into those kind of practices and making sure that they build trust uh, with the research security research community uh, to work together and so that researchers can, yeah, can believe uh, that the government will like support this and not use their research to hack citizens. Yeah, I mean, it's coordinate vulnerability disclosure and the vulnerability research that we are all doing one way or another is all about protecting users because at some point, me and you, we are everyone's, you know, someone's end user at some point. So, <laughs> so um, but we'll we'll get back to this in a minute. Um, I wanted to um, reach out to Jeff and Addison, like, okay, I'm a Ruby noob extraordinaire you know uh that's uh incontestable but still i'm i'm not sure like um the framework you were presenting tonight is a very well-known one so i i got curious how did you guys come up to work on like what's the backstory how did you come up to work on that so um as we, we kind of walked through the story quickly at the beginning of the talk and basically uh there was this Java instrumentation thing that I was building and uh, to kind of implement uh, instrumentation hooks and make it kind of quick and simple. The, the hooks were implemented in JRuby uh, so that they, they could, you could script them up on the fly, they could be loaded, you didn't need to compile things. And we got it working with a live REPL. So you could essentially uh, just inject a REPL into a Java process and kind of poke around from there with standard like reflection-esque um you know navigation uh and the REPL uh was this thing called pry remote uh pry is kind of the high-end REPL for ruby that is better than irb the default one and uh pry remote did all of this forwarding of the calls uh from this separate system uh vm or, or device uh with this DRuby stuff. And the moment we started looking at it, it was uh, really crazy because we were trying to make it so that, among other things, like the traffic was locked down and couldn't be messed with. And meanwhile, we have this thing that 
is plain text. You can just connect to a server from anywhere. If it's exposed, you can send it commands. Uh, we, we, we'll start looking at this and like, there's no way we can release this thing while this is uh, so exploitable. Uh, and, and then went on from there. Um, and essentially, Pry Remote is, from what I can understand, is essentially used as a sort of uh, debugging aid, drop down debugging, especially when you're debugging some Ruby stuff running in like a Rails app or whatever on a remote server. And you want to just drop to a shell and poke around and see what's going on with the variable state, uh, things like that. It's a... Uh, it's different. Uh, Bybug is the the kind of uh, debuggery thing that everyone uses for Ruby, and itself has a wacky just text based protocol like plain text over the network. And I I've seen some interesting things uh, from uh, like uh, you're dealing with uh, some auditing of some stuff a while back, and uh, there was an arbitrary send that could be issued. Uh, from some endpoint in an app, and we couldn't really control the arguments too well. Uh, but we we're able to reach by bug, which caused it to just start listening on a port on the server. We then connected to that and had it run arbitrary Ruby to compromise the the system. And so that was that was an interesting uh, POC. But all of these kinds of um, debugging aids essentially seem to have very just simplistic networking going on, like protocol stuff, and little possibly in the thought of, of security around them. DRuby can sort of wrap uh, TLS, although all the all the variable things still call it SSL, which gives you a hint at kind of how maintained that is. Um, but some of the things we didn't get into in the talk are that there is a technically a system for access controls of saying like which hosts can talk to what, but because you can smuggle those proxy objects into things, if you can trick like one node in a distributed group to talking with you, even if you couldn't get code execution for whatever reason, you could still potentially smuggle in an object that references another one of the hosts in the network that allows it to talk with that thing, but that you're not allowed to talk to. And you can essentially crawl up the, the, the map of the whole thing, um, the graph of it from node to node that way. And it gets a little wacky. Yeah, that sounds very interesting. Uh, I'm trying to behave here. Uh, so, but like when you, um, at some point you had to talk to, well, the people who wrote this, whatever, are right. So, well, I mean, we're, we're in a vulnerability research and, and disclosure and management track, right? So I sort of have to come to ask, you know, to, to ask this question. So what happened there? How did it go? So the interesting thing, right, is that the Ruby documentation says it's insecure and not to expose it to untrusted things, um, which is often, you know, how things work for, you know, arbitrary deserialization. It's like, you know, don't, don't talk, don't do Java deserialization unless you trust the data coming in. And it's like, can you ever trust the data that's coming in? Um, so we, we reached out to them effectively with kind of this, information on the fact that, well, actually, because of all these other things, uh, the clients are also exploitable. And they kind of took that information and sort of disappeared with it. And uh, unfortunately, like the most that we might get, because it's the protocol is kind of set in stone as it is. And I, functionally, I don't think it can really change because of the backwards compatibility it strives for. Uh, but what we were looking to see come out of it was that the documentation would be updated uh, to kind of reflect the additional dangers of using this. Uh, and I don't think that ended up happening. But again, it's kind of been known to be completely insecure. Like they themselves say, this is dangerous you know, don't, don't talk this protocol with things that you do not trust, but not necessarily in the right way that would give the proper warning. And so uh, given all the other things were kind of, essentially the protocol was known to be insecure and vulnerable for a whole bunch of things. And so we 
didn't treat it directly as having exploits on it because a lot of this was mostly exploitation techniques of known problems to a certain degree and kind of exercising all the things related to the protocol itself. Uh, but for Metasploit, on the other hand, users of this thing who did not expect to be using it or have that problem, uh, we reached out directly as this is a vulnerability, you need to deal with this. Um, because it, it is what it is as the API that it is. Um, you know, no one really is going to um, Sun or Net Oracle saying, hey, you need to yank this entire Java deserialization thing from the Java language. It just can't be allowed to exist, right? But you go to every single person who does deserialization and you say, hey, you're exposing this. You need to kind of stop doing that. And then alternatively, people also will go uh, to the libraries that have the gadgets and say, hey, you need to fix your gadget so it isn't exploitable. But really, the problem is the deserialization in the first place and not the gadget. Though um, in a couple of instances, it seems like uh, there have been a couple of universal Ruby gadgets, especially built into core Ruby standard library. I've tried to find a couple. I've, I've gotten close now and then, and, and other people have, have always found these really amazing ones. And uh, there is one, in fact, that we're using as part of our fully kind of weaponized CLI script thing. But uh, who knows if they'll patch something in a minor version update and break it. So that's why, like, when targeting the older version of the Metasploit payload, we still use the, um, the active record uh, serialization thing uh, because it's just completely reliable, um, effectively. There, there, there have been some changes uh, between super old, uh, old versions of Rails. And I actually once had to rework that payload to target, I want to say, Rails 2 or 3 that was still in existence somewhere um, because the existing payload, the, the class structure had actually changed. And so like at some point in the middle of, of the nested objects, something that was a class became a module or it was a module became a class. And so the default payload didn't work and I had to rewrite the, um, the way that the gadget was, was created. It was effectively still the same gadget. I just had to restructure it. Um, so it's my, my, my personal take is the, the gadgets are not the problem. It's the deserialization, unsafe deserialization that can control its own destiny effectively by saying, I am a foo object. Like, no, you should not be able to say you're a foo object containing a bar, a baz, or whatever object inside of you. You are what I should tell you to deserialize as, uh, which is kind of how protobufs works. It's uh, how JSON does uh, JSON to um, whatever in, in Java. Those are safe. Everything that has magic that can control what it deserializes as is fundamentally broken as an archetype. Yeah, I think we are set here for a huge structural thing, you know. <laughs> but um, so so Florian had to, to leave for another uh, meeting because uh, I guess on your side, guys, uh, it's still day. <laughs> so um, I have a question to Ivica because um, I, I was very much mulling over this uh, when you um, you were basically concluding your talk earlier. So you kind of, you're publishing the proof of concepts um, of, of, what you, of what you presented. And I was wondering, um, like, what is the risk model or the threat model, if you like, of, of this publication? Like, you know, it's it's always um, a question of how much am I providing something to be studied, examined and whatnot by anyone in the community? And how much can this thing be more or less, you know, readily used by, well, not very well-intentioned people? And... If they could use it, like, can you elaborate a little on the cost benefit um, ratio for for a potential attacker that well basically preys on your on your proof of concept? Thanks. So um, the existing pay payloads to like compromise any general. It, 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 it was the, the question. Sorry, oh, the question was for Ivica. <laughs> no, no, don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> okay, so. Um, there's um, one thing I would say that distinguishes my um, presentation from the other guys. 
the other guys are very sophisticated. They really found vulnerabilities in the products. But in my case, I actually, you know, I did not find any buffer overflow, any uh, irregularities in input processing, in, in um, uh, um, folder traversal or whatever. I'm actually using completely legitimate behavior of the protocol as described by RFC. The only thing that I did is I changed the attributes that say this is A to say this is B, whereas both A and B are legitimate. So in a sense, <laughs> this exploit is actually not an exploit. It's just, you know, playing within the boundaries that define legitimate protocol. So in that sense, um, yeah, sure enough, it can be abused because obviously the, the intention where you, you know, impersonate or spoof the device, um, and especially if can be if if this can be proven that was done for malicious purpose is you know bad thing. And yes, there is always a risk um, of making exploits or making you know um, write-ups about certain um, certain vulnerability public. But then it's, you know, kind of chicken egg dilemma. If we don't expose that stuff, you know, vendors might never be enticed to actually fix them. On the other hand, yes, exposing them obviously, you know, presents the risk that the malicious actor will misuse that and attack, you know, other parties. So it's like everything, you know, it's like, the scientist who invented, um, well, who, who, who realized and, and um, understood how to split the atom. And once when they saw the Hiroshima and Naga, Nagasaki demonstration of power, you know, they said like, oh, I regret that I ever did that. But it's, I guess, in human nature to actually use and abuse whatever comes out in, in any science. So I guess it's it's a kind of inherent problem of the way how people perceive, you know, the opportunities to either do some harm or promote themselves or help the society. And it's not up to, well, you cannot say that any technology is good or bad. It's only as good or as bad as people intend to use it. So, you know, it, it's, diff, it's difficult, I guess, moral or ethics behind using these tools is what determines your action and, and the consequences. Sure. You know, I mean, it's a very delicate balance to strike. And I've been kind of trying to play the devil's advocate here uh, because this is basically, and this gets me to my um, second and concluding question that is to, to all of you. Um, this is the kind of, you know, counter argument that we hear when trying to promote, well, wider publication of security research, um, more transparency um, from, you know, from the vendor side, from, from government side, and, you know, the whole VEP discussion that we just had earlier, um, and also, um, you know, trying to promote more community-based, uh, um, well, improvement of technology, the technology that we all use. So, so my concluding question to you would be, uh, as we have this um, very interesting and rich uh, set of skills and, and points of view here, um, like what would be your kind of um, crossed uh, recommendations from technology people to policy people and from policy people to technology people. Like, for example, um, something that, that didn't come up earlier, that, but that we all do at some point is reverse engineer something. You know, it's go beyond what is just visible. Like if you have an app, if you have like an app, yeah, you can always do a static analysis that brings you just zero knowledge or close to zero, like very little. So if I decided to go further and I don't know, um, you know, reverse whatever uh, Java 
app, uh, mobile app I have there. Uh, but because I'm well-intentioned and I think this is the only way for me to identify any potential vulnerabilities there, stuff that can cause harm. Um, and then I go and I report, you know, I disclose this vulnerability because I'm a candid person and well-meaning person. So, okay, uh, from a technical side of view, I need to do this. Um, and I, I like it. From a policy point of view, Mm, I don't know how it's in Canada, but for example, in Europe, you can't do reverse engineering like you want to. Uh, it's only accepted in very specific cases. And just, yeah, okay, we are on the record, but off the record, we are. <laughs> there are many of us trying to change that status quo. But, you know, that's the kind of things, like what would be your recommendations from technical people to policy people and from policy people to technical people on, you know, how can we move forward um, as a community and as a society, you know, using technology um, that is no longer a privilege to make technology more, um, at least less vulnerable, I would say more secure, but actually less vulnerable um, and, you know, make people more responsible for the vulnerabilities that they do or do not fix. Over to you, Addison, perhaps uh, we didn't hear I, you. So if you want to take this <laughs> one first. <laughs> I think uh, something interesting to point out is from the point of view of a, uh, a penetration tester, as someone who, who finds vulnerabilities in systems, there's a very clear uh, sort of trade-off that you make where either you disclose the vulnerability to the parties affected or you sell the vulnerability. And I think that the selling of the vulnerability is something that's often overlooked, especially by uh, the people who make policy decisions. But the selling of the vulnerability is something that is, is very easy to do. The, the people who buy vulnerabilities make it as easy as, as possible. And as someone who finds vulnerabilities, you are, you're doing a public service by, by disclosing it to the people who, who actually write the software from the people who actually use the libraries that you find the vulnerability in. And, and that's something that like, as, as someone who finds vulnerabilities, I want the world to be a better place. So I tell the people who write the software, like, hey, you, you have a bug here. Uh, hopefully you, you, uh, also agree that it is a bug and and hopefully you see the need to fix it and and sometimes you get pushback and and depending on your uh, um, how how strongly you feel about your your moral uh, beliefs you will you will uh, argue that but but really it's it's a you're you're fighting against this this system that that will, that there is a there is another side to this and this other side will will pay you very generously to buy these vulnerabilities and not disclose them to the people who write the software and i think uh this this sort of um from a policy side it's very easy to to not not sort of look at this and it's it's very easy to say like oh because because very often from a policy side, as soon as you know about the vulnerability, you're now liable for it. And, and legally, this, this puts you in very hot water and this puts you in, in some sort of situation that you don't want to be. And, and having random people on the internet show up and tell you about vulnerabilities that are in your systems is, is not something you want to happen ever. And uh, I feel like this is this is sort of a, a very difficult situation that we're in, as far as the internet goes and society goes, and, and finding some sort of solution to this problem where where people like me who find vulnerabilities in systems can go up to people in a in a I don't know a security role at some large corporation, and me being able to tell them about a vulnerability without them taking it as a threat in any way and and being able to take it as some sort of uh, a help that I, I'm intending. I mean, I'm intending to help them, free help. And uh, in, in a lot of times it's uh, assumed that it's uh, some sort of offensive attack on their, 
on their systems and and it, it puts me in in sort of like a, a difficult situation and maybe it's easier for me to sell that vulnerability and, and that's sort of the thing that as a society we need to we need to stop we need to stop making it so so beneficial for for people like me to sell these vulnerabilities and make it more beneficial for me to to provide those vulnerabilities to people who are in the power to to fix them yeah just for what it is worth um i participate in different policy work groups at the, at the international level and that question about how do we dry the gray market for vulnerab- vulnerabilities is on the table um it's just not the same t- timeline um, in policy as it is <laughs> in technology. So bear with us as we try to come up with something. <laughs> yeah, I think it's... Painful. I mean, you know, because there have been discussions about, oh, let's ask governments to be the recipients of, of those vulnerabilities uh, to try to counteract the, the gray market. And you're like, yeah. I'm not sure many people will be happy with governments not communicating anything but hoarding vulnerabilities. Uh, nah. So, you know, it, it's, yeah, the, the timeline is not the same. <laughs> but um, who else want to pick this? Um, yeah, yeah Stephanie, something. go ahead. Yeah. Um, what recommendations to the tech people do you have? <laughs> no. Well, um, Definitely to avoid these vulnerabilities from going into the illicit markets is about incentivizing good behavior. And I think a huge part of that is having the policymakers setting the rules of the game so that the security researchers, when they have a vulnerability, they know the type of activities that are allowed. So a lot of uh, coordinated vulnerability disclosure policies, they let you know the scope of activities that are allowed. So like they'll say pen testing is not allowed, or if you see personal information, well, you know, don't delve into it too much. Um, doing things like that to set the rules to the game so that everyone is confident in what they're doing and that security researchers trust that when they are disclosing a vulnerability, that they're not putting themselves into trouble. They're not facing you know legal liabilities for doing that and yeah at the end of the day making sure that these relationships are fostered because security researchers do want to help and there are ways to try to you know make sure that these vulnerabilities aren't going to be exploited and used for bad purposes sure um Petra I'm seeing your (laughs) t-shirt You want to jump in? Yeah. I, mean, I remember the time when we called CVD responsible disclosure and then everyone got worked up as to who is responsible for what. So we tried to change the name, right? Yeah. I mean, so I, I agree with everything that has been said. However, there are some very big problems. So the first one is with regards to incentives. Okay. So assume I am a moral. I am a hacker, I have skills. I find a vulnerability in whatever. Why should I report to the manufacturer when they're gonna give me a headache, they're not gonna give me anything except trouble when I can go to the gray market and get money for it, completely anonymously. And also, Reine, you said that in Europe, it is illegal to do reverse engineering. Uh, I don't live in Europe anymore, but I lived for many years. I published many vulnerabilities no one ever came to me. So basically there is no enforcement whatsoever of this law unless you piss off the wrong company and they go after you. Uh, But you know, that's even for a company with a lot of uh, lawyer money is quite hard to do. So I think that the big problem here is really a question of incentives. You have to incentivize people to go to you. I'll give you an example from my talk regarding router, consumer router vulnerabilities. I can't remember the exact numbers, but I think if you go on the net gear, they have a bug bounty and they offer 10,000 for a remote code execution vulnerability. In the black market, this, or in the gray market, not even the black, in the gray market, they start at 15K. So and, and they never pay the top 10K. You know, they always pay less. They always find an excuse to pay less. And we're talking about a multi hundred, hundreds of million dollar company maybe billion i think they're over a billion in revenue and they're paying peanuts you know you pay peanuts you get monkeys simple as that 
So there's the disincentive side. And then from the policy side, um, I think trying to control this kind of thing is really sticking your finger in them. You know, like I say, you can put all the rules you want in policy, but I don't care. I don't care because, you know, I take all your rules, I throw them out of the window, I do my research, I sell in the gray market, what are you going to do? You know, so you can't really, you have to, of course, you have to have some rules, right? But they cannot be restricted. They have to be, to kind of give you a legal framework. And that, uh, with the proper incentives, specifically financial incentives, you know, uh, is the only way to control the problem because otherwise it's like, um, you know, it's like, for example, how do you control uh, is very much in the news now cryptocurrency. You know, you, you have to shut down the internet, right? There's no way to control cryptocurrency except if you try to shut down the internet. And it's the same thing with vulnerability research in a completely different way. It's happening everywhere underground and you cannot try to control it. You have to try to mold it into the way you want. Sure. So, uh... As much as I would like to continue the discussion, I think there are other tracks coming after us. <laughs> but yeah, please feel free to continue the discussion over at Discord. Um, sorry if I had missed um, giving the, the, the word to the, the, the floor to someone. Um, and in any event, this has been absolutely great. I've learned so much, including much more than I would have ever suspected on DRuby. <laughs> so thanks again, stay safe. And I'm very much hoping we can meet someday in person when, you know, stuff settles down. <laughs> Thank you so much. much. Have Bye a now. good day or evening. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye -bye.